two of them. Uh, we bring back Paul Loop, the Government Insight Center. Uh, and I think this is going to be very special because what we've got here are people who have created value and understand how to create value and do what's right in a world where, frankly, it is just impossible to cut through the cacophony. So welcome our panel, and here we go. Uh, Cynthia, I'm going to start with you. Uh, this Why very morning, surprised. Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett came out against forecasting quarterly results. Uh, you are on the boards of Darden Office Depot, big lots. Uh, you're the chairperson of, for uh, Tractor Supply. Um, would scrapping quarterly forecasting build more long-term value at any of these companies? Oh, I think it absolutely would, uh, but I think it's idealistic to think it'll ever happen. Um, but even I think- if everybody, Even if everyone on the round table signed on? Well, here's the problem. I think, I think there will be demand for it, but I also think if I could wave my magic wand, it wouldn't be the quarterly guidance that's the issue, it'd be the overreaction to it uh, once people hear whatever the news is, because I think it's a whipsaw that goes back and forth. Having said that, Tractor Supply did stop giving quarterly guidance. They right. said we're only gonna do half biennial, whatever, half, half yearly guidance because our business is so seasonal and the shift of holidays and weather makes particularly, an, right in our sweet spot of uh, winter turning to spring and fall turning to winter, which is right on the cusp of quarterly ends, can be so, so distortive that we just stopped giving it and we did get very little pushback, but I think it's because our business was so seasonal and people There was insanity that. around the, the right. uh, big uh, investor meeting where here's a company that's done incredibly well, just amazing, the stock had dropped precipitously and the CEO was saying, listen, we're gonna come back and everyone was, Every analyst was, uh, was attacking him, and it could have been very much like what Ron described. And then right at the bottom, at the bottom, everybody turned on him, and that stock is up 19 straight points since everybody turned on him. It's a very working, good lesson about the good. analysts who've never seen it, who wouldn't know a tractor from a, from a boxing bag. <laughs> right, and, and very punitive, because it was the first time in, in like, 40 quarters, we'd ever miss numbers. And we missed numbers, and the stock went down like 35%. Right. I mean, it was just an incredible overreaction. Absolutely. So, yeah, Paul, very very uh, frustrating. Paul, what, would you advise any of your clients to say, hey, listen, we got to sign on with Buffett uh, and, and with Jamie? Um, I think everybody should be thinking about this right now and thinking what are the pros and the cons and assessing whether or not they need to put together a plan of action in case people start to go in this direction and they want to be one of the one of the ones that leads along, goes along with that pack. So, and in fact, we are hearing from our clients that are thinking right. about this. That's terrific. Yep. All right, Sean, I, look, I, you know, I know your company well, and your, your company, before you got there, had real issues, including incredibly unreliable forecasting. Um, you have since been what I regard as a paragon of beating the goals you, that you have set both short and long term. And I wanna know whether uh, Andy Grove, the late Andy Grove and only the paranoid survived, said, you know what, we can, grade, we can grade CEOs over a quarterly period because you were both short-term and long-term and I don't think you regard them as any sort of conflict at all. Well, we don't run the company for short-term, we run the company for the long-term and we do have annual guidance, we don't guide quarterly. When we started our journey in 2015, we really set a five-year algorithm out to 2020 and, and steered investors toward that. But we, we did not take an earnings per share holiday as we sought to transform the company. We tried to find opportunities within our own uh, organization, Waste, so we could continue to grow our EPS while we set our sights on a five-year transformation. So frankly, we've done both. Uh, but I do believe that, that uh, this quarterly guidance piece could, it certainly could lead management teams to make the wrong decisions for the long term. That's not how we run our company. And, and so far, we've been six, successful, and I expect that to continue. Right now, uh, just so we know, Steve Holmes, who's a friend, and uh, it was nice spell that uh, make it like the my like Buckdell commencement speech. So that was great. Cause Steve, <laughs> Steve's a Buckdell alum, and, and uh, uh, he's on the board. Well, my wife's on the board of Bucknell, and he's been most encouraging. And I, sometimes gotta, I like to talk about the personal. You got to read his commencement speech yeah. that he that he gave at Bucknell University. I never heard that history, your history. It's it's remarkable, really. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, you just finished for you, you just did something you didn't need to do. But you wanted to create even more value than you had, and it's been remarkable. You create, you split into a hotel, the biggest hotel franchiser and a fantastic timeshare company. Uh, would it be better to focus on longer-term goals as these two, for these two uh, brand new companies? Because I felt that they immediately had to feel like they had to please both short and long-term, and yet this is a, you know, they're doing it on the fly. It, it, it's a lot of pressure on these two gentlemen. Well, it is. It's pressure on everybody. But the fact is, if you're running a business you have to grow the business. And to grow the business, you have to have targets, you have to have goals. So internally, you're gonna have all those goals anyhow. 
and you can't sacrifice short term, you can't sacrifice long term for short term. So you always have to, you know, you always have to be talking long term. You also always have to be thinking long term. It's just a matter of do you take those short term goals and tell the world what they are. Now, I would be all for getting rid of uh, quarterly earnings um, guidance. I think that would be a great idea. But it's got to be kind of, in my mind, it's got to be an industry by industry thing. If, if my competitors didn't go, didn't go that way and continue to give quarterly guidance, I'm going to get so much pressure from the street and from analysts. And then they'll get it wrong, they'll be off, and then we're the ones who are flip-flopping around. So I think everybody needs to kind of move in the same direction here. How is it possible that, given the financials of both the two companies that are so far superior to its uh, to the to the ones in their sector, the compare, so to speak, uh, that it's it must be of great consternation that you could have what I would a great opportunity. But these two companies are better than everybody in their sector, and yet they're dramatically undervalued versus it. Is that just? The failure of the public markets, is that the, uh, the problem with the, being part of the S&P and being thrown out of the S&P? How do you explain it? Because it just doesn't make sense. Well, it doesn't. And I think that if you roll the clock forward a few weeks, it probably will be, look much different. Right now, there's a lot of disruption. You know, after right. a spinoff, you've got shareholders coming in and out and everything else. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay too much attention, unfortunately, to the next few weeks. That's just the nature of a spinoff. Uh, but then eventually the street will get it. But listen, we, we were under multiple, in my opinion, versus our competi co competitive set. And I think it's in part because of the brands that we have. They're not the sexy upper upscale luxury brands. We do have some of those, but you know, our meat and potatoes are days in Super 8, and that's mid middle America. So we're Walmart, we're not uh, Tiffany. And I think some people get attracted to the bright, shiny right. object, and that creates a following of investors and you know, I, I fought it for a long time. Now other people get to fight it. Very good. <laughs> All right, Paul, a board should play the role of helpful advisor and prodder and keepers of the shareholder flame. Uh, how can they keep the CEO honest in an era where they don't really have time or often inclination to rock the boat? And how do you prevent board members from just picking up the check rather than doing anything? Uh, and do you need active or former successful CEOs on the board, people of great stature, in order to be able to question a CEO. So that gets back to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. So first of all, I would say you need the right board composition, which should probably include some former CEOs, a good mix of people in there, so you've got those people with the right stature to push. But I would also say, Jim, that I think that the bar has raised on board performance in the last couple of years. Um, I don't, you know, somebody referred to it earlier, it's not your grandma's board anymore. I think that's still absolutely, that is true now. Um, between activism, between uh, all the crises, corporate crises, where was the board, all those kinds of questions, I think boards are really stepping up and they're doing a lot more. So, and board composition will help. Do people hear, did you, I each would like to hear some examples of what a board member offered you. Uh, to give an example of what boards can do, because I think there's a, uh, we hear rubber stamp, we hardly ever hear that a board member suggested, like Nelson, that they, they should do this or they should do that. I just want to hear something positive that a board member said, each of you just down the road, most people. Well, when I, when I joined ConAgra, uh, our board wanted to win, and at the time we were not winning at all. So what they did uh, that was really encouraged me to join the company is they said, figure this out. Uh, it doesn't matter how controversial your recommendations are, try to get to the bottom of what it's gonna take to create shareholder value. And there were no orthodoxies that would limit what we could do. So in, 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 from my point of view, the best thing our board did for our company was to really let us be clear-eyed around the issues we faced and be bold in terms of the change we would, we would embrace to make, make things happen. Steve, you, you did not split up by activists, but I have to believe that your board helped you try to figure out what was the right thing to do. Yeah, they did, but, but if, I, if I look back at what did my board do that I probably wouldn't have done without them, um, a lot of it is around the corporate social responsibility and things that were important to our board members. I have a board member who is the former uh, president of the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. George was very active in helping us develop a diversity program. We climbed up the ranks of, of diversity within our industry and really all industries. We were on the diversity in top 50. We wouldn't have gotten there if George had not given us the kind of guidance to do that. We have a, a, a board member who's the former Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney. He was the greenest Prime Minister in, in Canadian history. He pushed the sustainability issues really hard. So, so I, you, know, you can use your board members, and it gave me a lot of help 
in making those things happen, knowing that I've got my board behind me pulling in that direction. So I think they can do a lot of things. Jim, can I just go back to the board composition sure. for a minute? I think it's really important to have some CEOs, particularly really good CEOs, but I think it's also really important not to have too many CEOs on the board. Why? Because I think it changes the tenor of the boardroom, and I think, um, it, no offense to my people on my right, but I think <laughs> CEOs can, can uh, take up a lot of airtime. Oh, they can, <laughs> they can not think they're possible. right. <laughs> and they can feel competitive with the CEO sometimes. No, I, I, I want to drill down on that because a lot of us feel that uh, uh, it's hard to have people who are uh, just good-hearted people on the board who uh, don't feel either intimidated or feel kind of like they were put on to just, unless there was something that was egregious, they were just going to say, that's a good idea. Well, I, I'm not on any boards where anybody just feels like they have to say that's a good idea. But I do completely agree with you. I think having some really successful CEOs are really important. I'm, my point is just not too many. But I think it's you have to pick them carefully. They have to have the right relationship with the CEO. The CEO has to have respect and trust. And I think that they have to form a relationship that really lives outside of the boardroom so that the CEO has a safe place to go well, as a comp, to a confidant. I, I want to talk to you about Darden. Uh, because Darden is a very, uh, I was using that as the example that kind of defeats what Ram said, but it was very rare. And I just want you to trace the arc of it and also how you picked the CEO, because he's a remarkable person. He is remarkable. Um, well, I feel very notorious after your introduction. Um, well, it was a fascinating experience. Um, I would say um, more so than culture, it was, uh, I think, what was wrong in that situation. For those of you who don't know, Starboard threw out the entire board of Darden and was able to replace all 12 board members at, in, one, in one proxy fight. Um, so I think part of the problem was um, organizational structure and leadership. It was a very corporate focused culture as opposed to out in the field, really working with the restaurants and thinking about the, the people who you know, drive the revenues, who live and breathe the daily sales of the restaurants. But more than, more than that, I think the single most important factor in that being allowed to happen was that the board did every, the old board did absolutely everything wrong that you could do wrong to respond to an activist. They, they didn't engage. They pissed him off repeatedly. Every time they came back with a roadblock, he wanted more seats. And then they sold the Red Lobster business for less than the real estate value, which is when he went from wanting something like six or eight seats to 12 seats and just said, I, I want the whole board. And it was really remarkable that he was able to do it. Um, but it was the poster child of how not to respond to an activist. And when you, once you got in, oh, uh, so what, talk, talk about Gene, because that, that would be, I thought you'd go outside. I figured you'd pick some magician from another team. We did go outside. We did, we did a thorough external search, and we named Gene the interim. Um, Gene is the, a consummate restaurant operator. He lives and breathes uh, the restaurant business. He knows how to run it. He immediately changed it as interim CEO from this corporate focused entity to a very field focused entity. Um, the, the most impressive thing that Gene did to my mind was when he was interim before we named him permanent. Uh, you guys probably remember the late night shows and the 240 page report that Starboard did on Olive Garden and the breadsticks and it became sort of this joke. Olive Garden was really denigrated and Dave George who had just taken over Olive Garden two years before. Gene absolutely went to the mat for this guy because he was like nine toes out the door when we had our first meeting, probably. And Gene said, whatever you do, leave this guy in place. I'm telling you, he's doing 80% of what you guys wanted. It's been in the works. It's going to start working. You need to leave him in place, which was an incredible amount of board capital to spend when you're an interim and you haven't been named yet. And we were just really impressed with his leadership, with his backbone, with the immediate feel of the change in culture and the field focus and how much respect he garnered. Um, you could just see it. You could feel it. And so we just decided to move him from interim to permanent. And the results have been astounding. Yeah, been and amazing. Olive Garden has done a complete turnaround. Dave George is just a hero to this board where when we walked in the door, nobody would even make eye contact with him. Yeah, so. Who likes Olive Garden? Who goes? <laughs> 
Oh my God. Not our target not? audience. You guys should try it again. It's been completely <laughs> rejuvenated. It's a I was going to say, I want to know whether people understood, yo, I want to get card. people's view on the technology because I love the new technology on the table. It's awesome. And, and I like to take credit. My two college age sons were texting me during the board meeting saying, don't take the breadsticks away. Don't take the breadsticks <laughs> away. And Jeff Smith was reading my phone. Oh. <laughs> All right. So, Paul, let's go back to when I started the, the conference earlier today. I talked about what's the right thing to do when an activist knocks? And I think this is the panel where we, we can really figure that out. Uh, do we look at what the activist record is? I mean, I, I trashed Luxor earlier versus, say, Ron's record. Um, do we think they've got a lot of money, we have to take the call? Do we think, wow, you know what, this is, this is Elliot, we don't ever go against Mr. Singer, we gotta bring him in. What is the, what is the flow chart what, uh, <laughs> of what you suggest that people should do? So first of all, I, I suggest you do something before the call comes, right? You gotta do, you have to do all your shareholder engagement that we talked about earlier. You wanna understand, at least have a good idea where your shareholders are, where they stand, what their hot buttons are, what vulnerabilities you have, you've addressed, okay. and what you're still wide open on. Then the next thing I think you gotta do is listen. I mean, that's really the most important thing and listen with a thoroughly open mind versus a closed But mind. who's listening? The CEO, a special committee, the board, your advisors? I, I think it's all. It's all those people working together that have to figure this out. So, but I think you gotta bring the board under the tent, you gotta bring everybody under yeah. the tent from the very beginning. Does everybody agree with that or another approach? Well, I, we were never a, uh, a, a real target for an activist, but we did have an activist who was speaking this morning here, so well known, <laughs> um, who took a position on our company. And uh, they called out, and of course, the lawyers and the bankers all go into panic mode. Oh, don't talk to them, don't, don't, don't let them come in, don't do anything. And it was like, I said, well, we've done nothing wrong. We've, we've delivered everything for our shareholders. I'm not embarrassed for a minute to sit down and talk with them because we've done everything right. I said, in fact, let's have them at our office so they can see what kind of culture we have here. Great and response. so they came in, by the end of it, we were all laughing, they went away, they were a shareholder for a short period of time, made a bunch of money, and then went on their way. So I think in that case, if I had listened to my advisors, I would not have engaged with them. I would have waited and maybe had a special committee meet with them. Um, but in my mind, they're just shareholders. So come on, you want well, to look, talk? Right. In other words, had, uh, one of the things that, that Paul Singer talked about is you hire these people and they basically are warriors. Uh, and they're not, it's, it's like the Marines, don't hire us to be Peace Corps, we're right. War Corps. I mean, no. is, do we bring in the advisors too soon? Do we bring in intransigence too soon? Do we, uh, open-mindedness seems to be something that is forgotten about a lot of times. Well, I think you can, you can, you should bring them in soon because you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so you should protect yourself if there's something you should be doing. Um, but you don't have to listen to everything they say. You know, use your mind, you're the CEO. You should make your own decision about how you want to approach it. Just because the lawyers or the bankers are saying, don't meet with them, that doesn't mean you don't have to meet with them. You say, well, thank you, I appreciate that guidance. I'm going a different direction because I think I know, I, I think I can engage. And, and so that's what we did and it worked out beautifully. Yeah, I can build on Jim. I, I was hired into a bit of a crisis situation at ConAgra and before I got to my first earnings call, we got our first activist. Uh, so our posture from the beginning as a board was not to oppose a constructive conversation, it was to engage. I couldn't engage immediately because we were in a dark period right before our earnings. The day after my earnings, I went, uh, met with our new investor. Uh, what we quickly realized in communicating with each other is that we had exactly the same goals, which was to unlock trapped value, and that we had to move aggressively if we were gonna do it in the industry we compete in. Uh, so that was about three years ago. Uh, they, we, we worked constructively over the three years. They've done quite well. I think they've been very happy. And I think it's a, a case study of how to work well constructively against a common goal and really build a business that is going to succeed for the long haul, not just for a short-term uh, period. So did they think it was the same old Conagra under you? Well, I think the assumption is often that what they'll encounter when you find a struggling business is an entrenched management team and an entrenched board. Right. And, and that's exactly the opposite of what they found. So I think we quickly uh, uh, developed a respect for one another and we kind of said, let's get on with this. Uh, we're on the clock, we gotta move quickly, we gotta move aggressively if we're gonna seize this opportunity. And it's been a, it's been a positive three years and they've fared well as have other investors. A lot of people talk about, well I gotta get, they lip, they lip service millennials. 
they say, well, listen, you know, we have some millennials. Don't worry. Millennials really love our product. 20% of the new people who come in are, are millennials, which is, of course, meaning nothing, since that's about the distribution of America. You're different. You told me instantly what you were going to do and what millennials like. Millennials don't like plastic. They like paper. It's seeming like a small idea. It is huge. Millennials like popcorn. You know, this is really about the simplest thing you're going to hear today. If you're in the consumer brand business, you need to give consumers what they want. And if you continue to give them the stuff that they used to want, because you make the best margin on that, you're not going to have a lot of <laughs> engaged consumers. So uh, in our line of work, we have to constantly refresh these brands. And you can't do that unless you're an externally focused company. And that, with respect to the board, that's probably one of the best things we did as a company when we got started in this new chapter is we reset our company values. And the first one is what you'd expect. It's integrity. But then a couple of the others are unique. External focus and agility. And we got the board and management team aligned to these corporate values of external focus and agility. Why? Because the consumer is out there, not in a conference room studying a PowerPoint presentation. And that really engaged our board and engaged our management team that if we are not anthropologists studying these millennials and redesigning these brands for a whole new generation, we're dead. And we did that, and it's, it's working pretty well. Yeah, just so you know, the, we talked about the consumer packaged good stocks with Nelson, and all of them are down big except for you. And a lot of it are, are the amazing amount of innovation you've had, and the, and the switch and the direction and the recognition of how people have changed. The other guys are just trying to do it over and over and over again, the same thing. Yeah, for the last year in our industry in food, there has been a negative narr narrative that's been unavoidable, and frankly, it gets exhausting because our company has quietly delivered and delivered and delivered. And it's really been about innovation and modernizing brands. And it's been, it's been clearly working. Uh, we're growing, we're gaining market share, and we're highly confident that our financial results will continue to be strong. But it's a transformation. And as somebody pointed out earlier, you know, this is a multi-year journey, and we've had a lot of success, but a lot of runway yet to go. Uh, Sid, let me ask you. Uh, Office Depot and Office Max, both within the context of what uh, Macon Del Rahim said, the Assistant Attorney General for uh, Antitrust, and also these two companies in Amazon. I mean, it, they turned, I thought that they were plain vanilla. I thought they were both, they could have, they were interchangeable because the stores seemed interchangeable. But the culture was anything but interchangeable. The, the cultures were very different. Uh, by the way, I'm still mad that they shut down the Staples deal. That would have been great for shareholders. Yes. So take issue with your last speaker on that one. Um, but yeah, the cultures were incredibly different. And um, what was even more interesting was the board cultures were completely different. And so you took boards of 10 people each, and there were five that came from Max, five that came from Depot to form the new board. No CEO at the time. And every vote on every issue was five to five with no tiebreaker. So first we had to get, the, <laughs> we had to get our own act together. Um, we got a CEO who, in this case, was uh, transformative in terms of driving out synergies, but also transformative in terms of his style, which wouldn't work everywhere in every situation, but was very hierarchical and very directive, and it's exactly what was needed. And so he created the new culture, which is the power of what leadership can do. Mm -hmm. um, but first, we had to overcome our own self-imposed obstacles to agree. The one thing we agreed on was the CEO. Every, everything else was divisive. The one thing we, you're thank God. Pick one. That's yeah, a good gonna, one. It took us a while to get there, but we yeah. found the right guy. All right, Steve, I want to talk about uh, Wyndham Destinations for a second. Uh, I had the CEO on, on this week. It, it, the multiple is ridiculous. The dividend's terrific. And, uh, it, but when, as soon as I say timeshares, people are texting me and they're uh, going on Twitter and they're saying, well, you know what, Jim? That's not a viable model. Or they have to be sold, not bought. And what, what kind of product needs to have that kind of stimulation? Uh, the CEO came on the show and said that millennials like them. But he also said that uh, there are a lot of people who just think that the product is really good. And there are a lot of people who, once they're exposed to the product, they really like it. What did you do to try to make it so that the culture was not one that was considered to be Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? <laughs> Well, <laughs> frankly, when we bought these businesses back in 2000, 2001, they weren't that way, so we didn't have to change it. What we did was we instituted a culture that was, that was what we were all about, which, which is all about doing the right thing. And it's, it's what you'd expect for a corporation to have as a culture. But the fact is they are in a sales organization. The product is sold. It's not bought. Nobody wakes up in the morning and said, you know, I gotta go to the Wall Street Journal and a, and a week of timeshare. Let me go out and do that right now. 
you know, we bring people in, we expose them to the product, they decide whether or not they like the product. If they buy it, chances are they'll buy more of it in the future because people who buy, 50% of them buy more because they like the product. So those who have the product, I wish we had that kind of loyalty in the hotel business. There's huge loyalty to the timeshare business. But it's just, it's not a product for everyone. And when you look at the, the portfolio managers, it's so interesting, when I traveled around, I'd be in the Midwest and everybody has timeshare, they like it, they know all about it. You come to New York and people don't even want to talk about timeshare. Ah, no, no, it's not for me, I'm, I'm above that. Well, I've owned timeshare since 1980 and I love it. So, so I, know, I know for one, I've had a great experience with it and I know that uh, many, many consumers do. So does it need to change with the millennials? Yeah, well, absolutely, and we're constantly modifying and changing it. We're the first ones who had a points-based system versus a weeks-based system. So you have to adjust for what your consumer wants out there. But the fact is, everybody loves going on vacation with their family. And not everybody can afford the second home. So they like having, having another experience that's predictable, that's a, a great product quality, and where they can br bring their family and be safe and secure. So that's the environment. Uh, Paul, what, what's changed, say, in the last year or 18 months? I sense that there's a lot of a lot of change, both boardroom activists. Uh, what's different? So um, I, I guess one of the things that keeps coming to mind when I hear about this discussion we've had here around culture is just, I think, way, the way the board views culture has certainly changed in the last 18 months to two years, and that's because of a lot of the crises that have happened and a lot of things that they're hearing from others. But I think that in the past, the board, a director used to really rely on the CEO to set the culture, lead the culture, that was it. If the CEO said the culture's good, they would say, okay, the culture must be good. And now what we're starting to see more and more in the boardroom as they think about things is, what do we need to do to really test the culture, to really understand what the culture is? Or what do we do if we don't think the culture is right? How do we make those changes? So that is getting a lot more attention in the boardroom. We get a lot of questions about how does the board go about assessing the culture, driving the culture. Wait, why is it not more just cut and dried? It's like, okay, that stock's up huge. Who cares what a joke culture it has? Or uh, that stock's down, suddenly we look at their culture. I, I don't spend a lot of time. And ServiceNow is one of the greatest performers I've ever seen. Uh, Frank Slootman built the company. You guys probably don't know. Prob I don't know how many people in this room even know Frank. Uh, he was the hardest working CEO I know, and he wrote out a piece recently where he just said, okay, look, uh, I hire people. I tell them, you're gonna spend 100% of your time working in service now. Take a look at this stock, it's an amazing performer. And you, know, you wanna go do something social? You wanna go do something good for society? Make a lot of money for service now, and then when you're done, go do something good. And, and anyone who bought the stock made a fortune and can go do something good. Anyone who worked there made a fortune and go do something good. And yet, I think that's a very out of style uh, theory, but it, it's working. I mean, if everyone's doing service now, we'd all be better off. We'd all be giving more money to charity. We'd all be spending more time doing good things. Why is Slootman's view wrong? And yet, he admitted he was very defensive about it when he wrote the article. Well, I, I mean, again, I think that right now, the way culture is, you're trying to attract talent. You're using your culture to attract talent, to retain talent that you have. You're using it to help make you desirable for an acquisition or desirable in a right. negotiation with an acquisition. You're using it to drive a transformation, like a digital transformation or even any kind of a business model transformation. So you really need the culture to work for you. And maybe the culture is you work 100% of your time and you don't do anything else. That could work, but I'm not sure it'll work for the entire talent uh, makeup. Well, so I'm that, not sure it works for the long for term. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't think it's sustainable. I, I don't either. think it's sustainable. I think it leaks out of the P&L from the top to the bottom. Well, it's just you say it, because what, what Frank said to me, he retired, he said, listen, I got it to a billion dollars. I got the billion dollar reps. I'm done. Now it's time for a regular CEO to come in. <laughs> but you know what? There are very few companies that get to a billion reps. You should take a look. It is such a rarity that a company gets to a billion, billion revenues. And it, sometimes it takes a salutement to do it. And then when Slootman's done, a new guy comes in, and this was John Dotto who came in from eBay, and then was ready to make it a more, I guess, a, a, you know, a hospitable place. Yeah. But there is something to be said about having a real drill sergeant to get into a billion and then have him move on. And I, I, it's, it, it does work. All right, let me ask you guys about the stock market itself. Now, Sean, uh, I, I'm recommending your stock. And it, it's, been, it's very hard to recommend General Mills, very hard to recommend Campbell's, after, especially with the way that they treated her on the way out, which was shameful. Um, how often do you look at the stock price? 
Well, you can't help but look at it because I carry my phone around as one thing that pops up, but it, I, I will tell you, I don't sweat it because I have total confidence that if we deliver execution uh, the way we've been doing it, the stock price will take care of itself. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I, look at, I look at relative comps and I think I want ConAgra to break out here. I mean, I just want it to be the breakout quarter. So I look at it, I look at it multiple times a day because I want you back on the show. And because I think that the strategy is such a good one. But it's not, it isn't, it's an incremental mover. This is not Salesforce. Well, when you're building credibility uh, as a hundred year old company and trying to do something that hasn't been done in a long time, I don't think you're going to expect an overnight pivot in terms of investor sentiment. You have to earn that credibility and you've got to do it uh, year after year and, and, and quarterly call by quarterly call. And it's really on the back of execution and performance. So we're not going to be greedy. We're not in this for the short term. We're in this for the long haul. And, and we're patient. And, and frankly, we've got to put our focus on the consumer and on innovation, not on the daily stock price. If we do that, everything will take care of itself. It's back to your last question. This notion of being results oriented and doing good, these are not mutually exclusive concepts. We're in the business of feeding people. And if we do a great job delivering great food at a great value, we will deliver performance and it'll go hand in hand. Sean's the first guy told me that the millennials like the uh, frozen food aisle because it's inexpensive. <laughs> and they don't have a lot of money because they're paying $72,000 a year for college. Yeah, that's what I do. Okay, uh, Cynthia, you're on the board of a company. And I, I got to tell you, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of this company. And I'm not a fan of it because I check the stores. And they need to be, they need to be nicer looking. Big lots. Yep, I knew that's where you were going. <laughs> really? Yeah, because I agree with you. The so you're on the board. I mean, can you go in and say, guys, I just visited the one on Route 22 in, uh, near Watchung, and I saw candy wrappers on the register and a bed that was in the middle of an aisle. Um, so this is, <laughs> well, it makes it easier to carry out of the store. Um, I, I think there is a significant challenge there, but I think if you go in, they're changing it market by market. They do have a store of the future. I think if you, if you go to Columbus, if you go to Phoenix, you'll see completely different stores that look like mini targets. But as anyone who has bricks and mortar probably knows, changing a real estate strategy is, takes multi-years to do. You have to get out of bad leases. We're in a lot of bad locations. I mean. Yeah, you are. Well, who yeah, so Route 22, I grew up near Route 22. I grew up near Summit. OK. Um, All right. The Chicago stores, uh, I don't even want to drive my BMW between where I live and to get to the store, because they're bad neighborhoods, but it takes a long time to get from C real estate to B real estate. I'm not sure we'll ever want to be in A real estate. But I think it's a multi-year challenge. I do think we, we know what we're doing. We know how long it's going to take. We have liquidity and the capital to do it, and it's going to happen. Are you ever able to say, listen, I want you to go to a tractor supply and see what a gorgeous store looks like? They have done that. Yeah. <laughs> I have said it, and they have done it. Because the stores are, are, has anyone been to a tractor supply? They're just good looking places to shop. <laughs> and I find myself in the racetrack buying clothes that I never thought I'd be buying trying to get to where I needed the pitchforks. I know which one you go to, and I know you go on Sunday mornings. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right, so, so uh, Steve, when I look at all the things that you've done and I think about uh, the split, uh, I have to ask you, why, did, why are you done? I'm, why am I done? Yeah, why are you done working day to day? You're a great CEO <laughs> and you got all this. I thought you had another 10 years in you. Well, I, I might. I might. Who but knows? But for another company? <laughs> you want to go to your timeshare. Well, right now I've got a full-time job, which is really being the chair of both of these two, companies. Two full-time jobs. Yeah. yeah, two full-time jobs, being the chair for both these companies. And I don't know what I'm going to do in the future. And I don't, I don't envision myself as a CEO of a public company again. I've, I've done that. It was a lot of fun. But... But I, I, there's a lot else that I want to do. I'm very involved with philanthropy, and that's an important thing for me and my wife. So that's a big focal point. And I'm having three grandchildren born this year, so I got to spend some time with them. You know, so it's I got I'm, I'm not worried about not being busy. I'll have plenty to do. Well, I because I, I wanted to ask you. He deserves tremendous uh, kudos because of what I'm about to tell you. Not just because I know of his philanthropy. Uh, we haven't talked to nearly enough because it's been such halcyon times about what the Great Recession was like. Steve, your stock fell to two bucks, and you sure weren't quitting then, did you? No, I think that's if you want a good example of when culture, because that was part of this this panel was the was culture. Um, we had we had a gr good culture, healthy culture. Um, we went through that time. I know a lot of other CEOs who 
who kind of panicked and, and cut employee benefits, took out 401k matching, did a lot of things just to try to make the number. And you couldn't do that. I mean, this was too dramatic. The, the Great Recession was too much. So we just, we stayed on our course. We kept doing what we were doing. We doubled down on some training for the employees at that time. And we ended up coming out the other end and, and took off and, and did great. And now it's around, on a combined base, around 110. So we, we had a good comeback from that, that real low. But, you know, you could have had a lot of different reactions that low. And I think if we did not have a good culture across the board, across our enterprise, we would have had a lot of breakage. There would have been fissures in the business. We would have had people walking away, people giving up. We didn't lose a person during that time. Wow. And, and we actually recruited a lot of great people. So I, I give the culture of the organization, which wasn't mine, I just helped facilitate it. It's the organization that creates the culture. I give it a lot of credit because it was very, very resilient. All right, uh, Paul, I'll leave you with the last word. What have you heard today that, that surprised you or something you're gonna change? Because you have a tremendous uh, breadth of, of, uh, of opportunities ahead of you to try to influence people. And I'm just kind of just curious, as someone run the conference, what you're hearing? Yeah, no, I think some of the most important th things that I've heard today are really this whole theme around listening and paying attention to what investors and other outside stakeholders are saying and listening to things like, what is your opinion? What are other opinions? I think that that whole deal is probably the most important thing that companies and directors should be doing today is really stretching out their ears and using them. Well, terrific. I want to thank Sean, Stephen, Cynthia, and Paula. It's a great discussion, and I learned a ton. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you.